So uh, the book, of course, is uh, inspired by uh, the great Martin Luther King in his second most famous speech at the culmination of his march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, in which he asked rhetorically, how long will it be before this, that, and the other? How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. He got this from a 19th century abolitionist preacher named Theodore Parker, uh, who in 1853 said um, that of the moral universe that my eye sees but little ways. Uh, I cannot calculate the curve, uh, uh, but I can divine by conscious that uh, it is bending toward justice. So that, that, that's where that metaphor comes from. And that's pretty optimistic in 1853, you know, before, uh, more than a decade before the abolition of slavery in this country. Uh, so that's some real optimism. And I'm an optimist, so I think uh, we've come a long way since then. Uh, Dr. King gave that speech in March of uh, 1965, and just several months later, in August of 65, President Johnson signed into uh, legislation the bill, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, with Dr. King looking on. Of course, having the franchise to all adults men and women and people of color and anything else. It's part of what it means to be a liberal democracy. This graph from the book tracks the um, evolution of, of democracy since uh, the early 1800s when there were zero, uh, all the way up to uh, the little burst you see. After the First World War, then a decline during the Second World War, then another burst after the Second World War, and a huge burst during the 1970s of democracies from zero to 118 now. It hovers depending on which country is you know, bordering between being a democracy and a semi-democracy or not a democracy. There's a few hovering on the borders there uh, as defined by the Polity Project. The Polity Project, this scale of, uh, of uh, one to 10, those scoring eight or more, the Polity Project scores countries on how good their democracies are. You know, some are better than others, some are just really crappy. Uh, how transparent the elections are, to what extent money, uh, corrupts the election process. Fortunately, that is not a problem here. <laughs> uh, I, I, we're probably down like to a seven or a six now. Um, and uh, of course, the, um, the, the, the right to, of women to vote didn't come about in the United States until 1920, the whole women's suffrage movement. Uh, you could track that here uh, with uh, the first, the very first places on earth for women to vote were these islands, Cook Islands, the Isle of Man, Pitcairn Island you know, where the bounty uh, people left. I think there's only 12 of them, and seven of them were women, so they got the vote. <laughs> uh, United States in 1920. Uh, look at this, Switzerland, 1971. That's pretty late beginning for a Northern European country. Samoa's to the last. Saudi Arabia, maybe in 2015, I'm hoping optimistically. I like this one when I looked it up. Vatican City, never. <laughs> but they don't have women there, right? So, I mean, nobody to vote. <clears throat> it's another problem. Okay, so uh, <coughs> they should try it. <laughs> anyway, that's another, anyway, so uh, I would follow this woman anywhere. Inez Milholland was one of the early suffragettes who led a march on Washington, D.C., right up to the Capitol on that white stallion. Imagine having to be one of the, the cops to try to block that with a sea of protesters behind her. And, uh, and it was finally passed in 1920 after, after many years. I will read for, uh, to you from, the, um, uh, uh, from, from a portion of my book here that um, uh, it, it came down, so, so to pass an amendment, you have to have three quarters of the states. Uh, so at the time, that was, um, uh, Tennessee was kind of the, 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 the split state there. So at long last, in 1920, the 19th Amendment, originally drafted by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Statton, uh, was passed by a single vote. Thanks to 24-year-old Harry T. Byrne, a Tennessee legislator who had originally intended to vote against his state ratifying the amendment, there he is, which needed ratification of 36 of then 48 states, but changed his mind because of a note from his mother. <laughs> she says, dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I've been watching to see how you stood, but have not noticed anything yet. <laughs> Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. Your mother. <laughs> so in the end, then, suffrage for women came down to the vote of one young man influenced by his mom. And oftentimes, that's how these rights revolutions come about. You just never know. These people got to stand up and say what they 
It's on their mind. Uh, continuing, it was rumored, uh, rumored that the anti-suffragettes were so angry at his decision that they chased him from the chamber, forced him to climb out a window of the Capitol and inch along the ledge to safety. And thus, the 19th Amendment was uh, dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century. Uh, so, much progress. I have a whole chapter on you know, civil rights, women's rights, uh, gay rights, and same-sex marriage rights, animal rights in the middle of the book. Uh, so here's just one graph tracking the percent of 25 to 32-year-old women with at least a four-year college degree. In, 19, in the early 70s, when I was in college, uh, women were eight, eight percentage points behind men. That changed by the early 1990s where they overlapped and crossed. And today, uh, women are about 7% ahead of men uh, earning college, four-year college degrees. And of course, having an education really does pay off, literally. You make more money. Uh, this is a, a women's earnings as a percentage of men's among 25 to 34-year-olds, just when your career is taking off and you start earning real money. Uh, in 1980, it was 67%. Now it's 93%. Okay, we don't have parity yet, but we're, we're getting there. So again, the, the, the arc metaphor, it's just a metaphor, it's not a perfect linear curve, there's bumps, you know, and it's, I'm not saying things are perfect, we have a long ways to go, but they're much better than they used to be. Uh, one of the beauties of writing this book was that I, I was able to write my chapter on gay rights and same-sex marriage right in the middle of a rights revolution, uh, in which we could see it unfolding before our very eyes. <clears throat> I hear some of the change in attitudes uh, from the... Um, uh, from the 1970s all the way up to uh, 2010. Different surveys, the, the uh, General Social Survey, Gallup, Pew, and a few others, should uh, same-sex marriage be legal? Uh, is it morally wrong to be gay? That sort of thing. So the trend lines are all in the right direction. Uh, even our own president changed his mind. On the campaign trail, he said, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman, not in favor of gay marriage. Um, of course, you never know if you trust what people say in an election, because <laughs> you have to get elected or else, you know. Uh, and then in 2012, he said, I've just concluded that for me personally, it's important for me to go ahead and affirm that I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Uh, so you can see here on this curve where they cross those um, in favor of it and those against it. So that's, that shifted about 2011 or so. And, and these lines are, are, are diverging rapidly, almost by the week. Uh, whenever the surveys are taken by Pew and Gallup, uh, you know, the, the numbers keep shifting rapidly. In fact, my, my book came out last Tuesday, and it's already out of date. <laughs> uh, just, there's just a lead time there. In more uh, secular European countries like Germany, gay rights and same-sex marriage is it's just a non-event. This is a, a, a gay couple that uh, my wife knows. This is uh, her dancing partner, Heiko, and his husband, uh, Jürgen. And, uh, you know, it's just really, in Germany, uh, which I've, got, I've been there a lot now, uh, nobody cares. It's just, no one discusses it. It's a non-event. And they wonder, and they look at us like we're barbarians. I mean, you know, it was only three-quarters of a century ago that Germans were locking up homosexuals along with gypsies and Jews in concentration camps. Uh, so they're already accelerating ahead of us on that. You can see who... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> You can see he was leading the revolution uh, by age. Um, so millennials, people born after 1981, are leading the charge. They're most in favor of it. Um, and, uh, and then the Generation Xers are pulling up behind us. Baby boomers are sort of lagging along there. And the silent generation, the greatest generation, they're, you know, sort of fingernails are dug into the past, hanging on for dear life. Uh, but, they'll, but they'll get there. They're, they're, you can see they're, they're, they're coming up. <coughs> I know this is Seattle, and I'm from L.A., so it's a different demographic. But go to the Midwest, you'll see what I mean when you see signs like this. <clears throat> so we can see who opposes these kinds of revolutions. Um, white evangelicals, black Protestants, white mainline Protestants, and Catholics. Uh, and then the religiously unaffiliated, the nuns, the secularists, the atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, humanists, and so on. Uh, we're leading the charge here. <clears throat> By the way, I have, uh, I have some good news for those of you who favor both gay marriage and pot legalization. <laughs> uh, I found some biblical support uh, for both. I did. I've been doing some research, <clears throat> and uh, because it says in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man lies with another man, he must be stoned. <laughs> <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the abolition of judicial torture. You know, I know we, we don't practice this anymore. We practice enhanced interrogation. But uh, on the books, it's illegal in uh, pretty much every country on earth. This is the uh, win, win countries, uh, number of countries that uh, adopted the, um, uh, the abolition of judicial torture. Uh, so it happened for us in, in, the, in, the, in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, the um, cruel and unusual punishment. What do I mean by cruel and unusual punishment? Well, uh, breaking on the wheel was one fun way to uh, take care of people you didn't like. Burning at the stake. Sawing people in half was a great pastime. You hang them upside down. Uh, impaling people on the stake through both orifices or just uh, tearing their skin off uh, with uh, long poles. The arguments against judicial torture, as were the arguments against slavery, were made by Enlightenment philosophers. Enlightenment philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and Cesarea Beccaria. The latter, Beccaria's book, uh, an essay on crimes and punishments, uh, in 1764, was the first to articulate the principle of proportionality. The punishment should fit the crime. At the time, the death penalty was uh, on the books for over 220 crimes, including uh, robbing a rabbit warren, pickpocketing, and insulting the king. Of course, well, that's a given. Uh, but, but this became uh, unpopular uh, during the Enlightenment and, and into the 18th century as countries began to abolish uh, the death penalty, capital punishment, and now no European countries practice it. Here are some of the more clever ways people use to kill other people. Uh, this is the earliest known portrayal of a capital punishment. <clears throat> uh, it, it's, it's from uh, Christopher Bohm's book, The Origins of Morality. He's an anthropologist, and he found this early painting. It's tens of thousands of years old. Basically, it's 10 archers with their bows and a guy on the ground with 10 arrows in his body. So they killed him. Why did they, why did they kill people? Why, why, why do people employ capital punishment? It's the ultimate form of justice. Somebody is not playing nice by the rules. So first you start off by saying, that's not very nice, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and then if they keep doing it, you say, you know, you really, really shouldn't do that because we're going to get really mad. And then you tell everybody and gossip and, and so on, and then you punish them and shun them and do what you can. And if they still are just bullies and they, they're free riders and they're, they're hurting the group, uh, well, as Christopher describes in the book, you just take the guy out for a hunt one weekend and you just don't come back with him. <laughs> and that, that's how it worked. Now we have more humane uh, ways of killing people. The a guillotine was a considered a moral advancement, a, a less cruel and an unusual punishment. Uh, firing squad, uh, old Sparky, uh, the electric chair, uh, and, uh, and then of course the you know, lethal injection, which is always um, described as botched these days. I really don't understand this because if the guy dies, it's not a botched execution. He's dead. <laughs> it worked. Uh, what they mean by botched, of course, it took too long. You know, 15 minutes, half an hour, hour, two hours, some of these go on. I really don't understand that either. I've had dogs my whole life, and we've had to, you know, euthanize some of them, take them to the vet, they just lie them on a blanket, they give them two injections, the whole thing is over in about three minutes. Just take these guys to the vet if you've got to do it. <laughs> don't mess around with, you know, this idiotic process we have. <clears throat> Uh, but in fact, the death penalty is on death row. These are uh, the U.S. death uh, sentences by year uh, from the 1970s. Of course, there was, this is following the crime wave of the 70s and 80s, why the, it spiked so much. And then the crime decline of the 1990s caused the decline of the number of death sentences handed out. And of course, the number of executions actually carried out also has been declining since the early uh, since the uh, mid to late 1990s, following the wave of the decline of handing them out. Most people on death row die of old age. My state of California hasn't executed anybody in ages. Uh, it's super expensive, and um, they get it wrong too many times, and I'm nervous about giving the state that much power, so I changed my mind on the, on the death penalty thing. I used to be for it. Uh, because I felt sympathy for the victim's families, but now I think there's too many reasons why it's a bad idea. So I changed my mind about that. And that is the wave of the future. I'm predicting that by mid-2020s to 2030 at the latest, uh, n there'll be no more uh, executions anywhere. It'll be dead and gone. 
The abolition of slavery, <clears throat> you can see that here on countries that abolish slavery. It's illegal in every country in the world now. It's still practiced a little bit with sex tra trafficking and slave labor in a lot of third world countries, but, uh, but we don't have to fight the ideas argument anymore. Nobody thinks it's a good idea. Nobody thinks it should be legal. It's illegal everywhere. So now you just have to enforce the law in places where the governments are weak and corrupt and, and, and not very uh, efficient. Homicides um, have gotten much better. In the Middle Ages, if you go back, say, to the uh, uh, 13th century, uh, there was about 100 homicides out of what, every 100,000 people, and that's a hundredfold more than it is now. In European countries, it's about one per 100,000 murders. In the United States, it's about eight per 100,000 murders. We're about eightfold higher than European countries, but, but if you take out inner-city drug-related homicides, then we're much closer, about <clears throat> two and a half per 100,000, so just about twice as much as in Europe. So in other words, um, the chances of you dying violently were 100 times higher in the Middle Ages. So you wouldn't want to have lived back then if for nothing else the dentistry was really bad. There's a few of the ways people died. I just took these pictures in this museum in Copenhagen um, in which uh, they dug up these skulls and just of our Paleolithic ancestors. This guy died, his skull was bashed open and there's a spear point in his sternum here. This guy has an arrow shot through his skull and he, he has a dagger in his, in his sternum. Um, what about war? I mean, surely uh, having armed conflicts become much, much worse. Uh, and in fact, that's not the case. Well, it depends on how you measure it. Of course, the raw numbers are much higher, but the raw numbers are higher because the populations are, are bigger, there's more people to kill, and the technologies for killing are much more efficient. But what we want to know is not how many people died, but what are the chances of you and I dying violently in a war? In uh, our medieval, in our ancestor, uh, Paleolithic ancestors, which are these data sets here, which are, each of these is a different archaeological site in which archaeologists go in there and they dig up and they look for skulls like that that are bashed open and arrow points and things like that. Uh, and these are modern hunter-gatherers, these are modern uh, horticulturalists, and these are modern states, including Nazi Germany and Japan and Soviet Union and so on, terrible, terrible, terrible state, state places to live. Still way better than any of these. In terms of just the likelihood that you will die violently, not the raw numbers. The raw numbers are admittedly high. As in the 20th century, which is often portrayed as the worst century ever, but as Steve Pinker likes to remind us, the 20th century was 100 years long, not 50 years. And, uh, and so something dramatic happened. These are just war deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, so here it was, you know, 300 per, per 100,000 as opposed to one now of homicide, so comparing wars. But after, after um, 1950, something dramatic happened. The whole thing changed. That is the thing that's hard to explain. This is what's always happened for 500 years. European nations were at war with each other constantly. All of a sudden, it just stopped. Uh, we'll expl I'll explode that up here with a graph from um, uh, Max Roser. If you don't know Max Roser's research, he's an economist in England. And uh, he, he tracks um, the hum human progress uh, by different measures, so he's got great data sets. So that little bump there is this, oops, is that big bump here. Uh, so these are worldwide battle deaths per 100,000 people, so, you know, 24 versus 300. And, and it just goes down to, you know, 10, and 5, and here it's in the low single digits now in our time. So even though all you hear about in the headlines are, you know, battle deaths and conflicts and murders and riots and all the bad news, if you follow the trend lines instead of the headlines, you can see it's much better. Even genocides, um, of course, it peaked. And the worst of it were the Nazi, Soviet, and Japanese genocides. Uh, these are Rudy Rummel's estimates, which may be a little on the high side, but still dramatically huge compared to the genocides of the last few decades. Rwanda, Cambodia were terrible, but not as terrible as these other genocides. And so there's even progress in that. So how far is the moral arc bent? Today's conservatives are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. If you think about it, because people always go, wait a minute, what about like Donald Sterling? And I'm from L.A., the owner of the Clippers. Isn't this an indication that 
people are still racist, making these disparaging remarks about African Americans. No, it's the opposite um, uh, conclusion from that. Here's this old guy in the privacy of his home with his mistress complaining about African Americans coming to his game. And that is now a huge event which, you know, he, he gets forced to sell his team and so on. By the way, no one ever brings up, wait, his mistress? It's like, well, whatever, everybody does that. <laughs> uh, but most old guys in the 1950s thought like that, and they weren't particularly private about it. It, it was just kind of a no big deal. Of course, we all know, you know, so on now. Now, most of us don't even think like that. And the few that think like that keep, try to keep their mouth shut, and when they leak it privately, it becomes a big thing. So that's a sign of progress. It seems ironic, but it does. Um, but events like Ferguson and Trayvon Martin, of course, these are tragedies, but there are far fewer of those. I mean, the number of police killings and things like that um, are, are m much better now than they used to be. I mean, the inner city conflicts between blacks and whites in the 50s and 60s are were much worse than they are now. Um, again, Max Roser's got some research on this. These are the number of lynchings from uh, the 1880s to the present. They zeroed out at, at about 1950 or so, lynchings. Lynchings used to be quite common in the early 20th century. They never happen anymore. And remember this great debate over interracial marriage? Yeah, me neither. I mean, what? What were they thinking? In 1959, 4% of Americans approved of interracial marriage. <coughs> now you don't even hear about that. How, wh why would anybody object to that? Well, apparently some do because it's 87% approved. Um, so I don't know who those people are, but... They're, they're probably the old guys, the, you know, the silent generation. Soon they will be gone. Um, well, sometimes that's what it takes to change people's mind in the next life. Um, you just think about the gay marriage thing. In five years, it will seem like this. Like, what? 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 Who cares? Gay? Whatever, dude. I mean, come on. What about terrorism? All right, terrorism is a, is a little bit of a concern, uh, but not in the way you might think. First of all, uh, no terrorist organization has ever overthrown a state and set up a new government. Governments like Syria, they were put into place legally and then became corrupt for other reasons, but not for terrorist reasons. Terrorists do kill people, but the number of people killed by terrorists is in the statistical noise compared to homicides and suicides. Just compare the United States. 13,700 people die of homicides by gun alone in the United States every year. 19,000 by suicides, uh, by gun only. There's other ways you can kill people and kill yourself, but guns are the most popular one. Um, and, and so compare that to the, you know, the dozen or so Americans who die each year and the, and the couple hundred uh, people around the world. So terrorism is not an existential threat in terms of like conquering America or throwing, overthrowing a European state. Uh, they're not a threat in terms of, like, the number of people they're going to kill. So what are they a threat of? Terror. It's in the name. Getting states to spend, well, how much have we spent? Three trillion? It's going to be about three trillion dollars by the time we tally up the two wars and Homeland Security and the NSA and all the measures we take. Now, I know it's not the same as traffic accidents. 35,000 people die a year on traffic accidents. Cars are not people. They don't have agency, and they don't intend evil on us and so forth. It's hard to... We're accustomed to that. The terrorist stuff, I know, it's like freaks people out. But uh, So to the extent that they're winning, it's only because they're, they're getting us to spend a lot of money. I'm not sure we need... We at least need a, a national dialogue on this. No politician will say this. You know, because it's, it's, you're weak on terrorism or something like that. But let's, you know, have a reality check. To what extent is this, you know, really a threat? Uh, the political scientist Erica Chenoweth, since this is a data lecture in the book, uh, she has the best data set on this. Uh, Erica tracked uh, all, every single nonviolent and violent campaigns for political change over the last three quarters of a century and tallied up the successes and the failures. So nonviolent campaigns for political change were twice as successful as violent ones. This isn't necessarily terrorism, any, any kind of acts to try to overthrow a government. Uh, and partial success, nonviolent, uh, were twice as successful as violent. And failed attempts, nonviolent, were three quarters, th three times more likely than nonviolent ones. So, and you can see the change here. Uh, violent 
campaigns uh, for political change were more common in the 40s and 50s, and then they got surpassed, and now it's much more common to try to bring about change through peaceful protest. It's a much better way to do it. And then finally, I have to worry about this. I have to say something about this since it just happened. <coughs> I worry about this a little bit because I publish a magazine, and I don't want to end up like this guy. And, um, and now, we don't do much on Islam, and we do nothing on Islam. We're a science magazine. But, but to be fair, um, it's the ideas behind this. And so just, just as a reality check, just to make sure that I, I know that you all know what's behind these kinds of attacks, is a little pop quiz. What did the murderers shout when they killed the staff at Charlie Hebdo? Moses rocks. Jesus saves. Vishnu lives. Buddha thrives. Atheists rule. Of course. And, and, and so we all know this. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's a sort of hypersensitivity in the American media about this. You know, you don't want to be accused of being an Islamophobe. All right, so first of all, we're attacking, criticizing, satirizing, Bad ideas, not bad people. So we've got to focus on the ideas. And it's too broad to say religion is the problem because there's a lot of religions. Most religions are not violent like this. Most religions went through the Enlightenment and they're peaceful now. And even saying religious extremists uh, are, are, are the problem is not correct either. Jains are religious extremists. They, you know, they have this thing about not killing anything, including bugs in the path that they have to be careful not to squish when they walk and so on. That's pretty extreme, but I'm not worried about the Janes showing up at my offices at Skeptic Magazine. Um, so it's really violent religious extremists based on bad ideas. What kind of bad ideas? Ideas related to Sharia primarily, in my opinion, are the ones that lead people to do this. Now, <clears throat> as I'll talk about in a little bit, you know, most violence is committed in the name of some moral cause. Most homicides are moralistic in nature, for example, about 90%. Only about 10% of murders, homicides are committed uh, in, in an instrumental fashion. That is, I, I killed him because I wanted his car or something like that. Most of them are, you know, spats and disputes and love triangles and honor killings and, 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 and you know, status amongst gangs, things like that. In other words, to the murderer, the victim deserved to die. To the murderer, the, the murderer is the judge, jury, and executioner of a moral crime. That, that's in the mind of the, of the killers. Um, so to that extent, what, what extent do, do people believe these ideas? Okay, so in, in the Global Terrorism Database, uh, which was just announced last week, so um, this is a database of 125,000 terrorist attacks from 1970 uh, to 2013. Uh, so it's a data, it's a public accessible, you just, you can type in anything you want and, and get, so I just typed this in the other day, I just typed in Islam, real, in, terrorist incidents related to Islam, okay, so, you, so our intuitions that you seem, it feels like we're seeing a lot of that in the news, but you have to be careful not to follow the headlines, because you never know, uh, so anyway, but, but that does seem to indicate there's an upswing of terrorist incidences related to Islam, and then I want to look at, you know, the the different kind of beliefs that, that, that Muslims hold around the world. <clears throat> so this is from a Pew report that was just published in late, um, it was published in late 2014, the data was collected in 2013, on 38,000 Muslims around the world in pretty much every country where there's at least 10 million Muslims or more. And these were not just paper, pencil, or internet surveys, they were in-person, may I speak to you in your language and record what you believe. And, and so those, those are much more reliable surveys than just internet surveys, for example. So and anyway, the, I'm just going to do a big data dump on you now, but th the point is they're non-trivial numbers, significant percentages in, in these various countries here, upwards of half, 30%, 40%, and so on, in this particular one believe, that, um, uh, believe in the death penalty, capital punishment for leaving the religion. <coughs> Uh, here is uh, percentages in different areas of the, of the world where uh, Muslims believe that Sharia should be the official law. Now, this varies because some of them will say, well, I also think you know, people should be able to practice Christianity or whatever they want. Okay, so that's good. But, but, but the moment you start to also think that Sharia is the revealed word of God, that's the dark green on the right, versus people just wrote it, which is on the left, inspired by God, whatever the difference would be. 
you know, if God is speaking, somebody's writing it down somehow. Uh, so whatever the difference is. But, you, but again, the percentages are fairly significant of people that believe that the creator of the universe wrote a book and he handed, and he handed it to us and said, those are the rules. Well, if you really believe that, then that's a pretty serious, strong belief that drives behaviors. I mean, this is what I do is I study um, to what extent people act on their beliefs. And if you believe that, that's pretty, pretty powerful. <clears throat> Here are um, favoring corporal punishments for crimes such as theft. By corporal punishments, I mean like cut off his hand. You know, an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, and so on for theft. Um, or canings and whippings and whippings, you know, th those sorts of punishments, corporal punishments. Or again, punishment stoning for adultery. Uh, the point, again, of the data dump is that there's a, a, a significant percentage of Muslims believe this. So I think uh, to this we should say nine, as the Berliner Courier said, the day after the uh, Charlie Hebdo killings. There, there was, all, all the European media was all over this, reprinting the covers and so on. I like the Independent in England, what they, they did about it. I like this one. You know, you, you break our pencil today, we have two pencils tomorrow, we're going to keep we're going to keep believing in free speech, or the uh, other Berliner Zeitung. They just republished the covers. You don't want to, you don't want, like the covers published? Okay, we're going to publish all of them <laughs> and see how you like that. Okay, so that's my little sidebar on that. Um, these are things we should be concerned about. I don't think they're existential threats, but they're the kinds of things we need to pay attention to. All right, second half of the talk. Uh, what has caused the moral sphere to expand to include more people? Because that's that's really what's behind the arc is, is that we've expanded the, our, our moral considerations to more people beyond our just our kin and kind. So in other words, the selfless gene model explains why we, we'd be nice to ourselves, our twins, our brothers and sisters, our parents, our kids, our grandparents, our grandkids. You know, that gets you all the way out to here, all the way out to, say, members of your in-group. Uh, and, and, th and that's driven by two moral principles, help your kin and kind, uh, and reciprocity or reciprocal altruism, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. But that doesn't get us way out here for strangers in other groups, other members of our species, you know, other, other members yeah, and other species mem like mammals and so on. How do we get out there? Okay, so um, the problem that we're facing and, and what's been partially driving the, the moral arc is that we have a dual human nature. So any political system that's based on a premise that we have one aspect of our nature, it's very simple, is, is going to be wrong because of this. Uh, and, and most of our nature related to morality involves fairness and justice. We, we want things to be right. We want people to be treated fairly and so on. And so we have this urge to help people as well as hurt people. Not hurt people randomly. So here I'm talking about normal people, us, not the one to three percent psychopaths, people with brain tumors and I'm not talking about the outliers. I'm just talking about average people. <clears throat> people don't want to hurt other people just for fun, except for the sadomasochism stuff or whatever. But most people don't do it. They do it for another reason that I'll show you. We're both co cooperative and competitive. We're altruistic and greedy. We're, we have better angels and inner demons, as uh, Steve Pinker says. So uh, I'll give you two video examples of this. I have a whole chapter uh, uh, laying out the uh, case for why I think uh, the moral sense is, is part of our nature. We are by nature moral, and you don't need any more than that. To the, the theist argument, why would you be moral without God, is because I was born that way. It comes with being a member of our species. We have a sense of right and wrong. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to show you a video clip, only 20 seconds long. You're going to see these three people talking for just a second. I'll, I don't have no idea where this happened or who these people are. <clears throat> I think it was in Europe somewhere. This guy reaches out and shoves this woman back, and she stumbles a little bit. This guy reaches to grab her and misses her, and into the train pit she goes. Boom, right on the track. This guy starts to reach like he's going to help, help her, to save her, but he, you can see he's just overwhelmed by this urge that I'm going to punish this bastard for doing that. That was wrong. I am going to nail this guy, and boy, does he ever. He just cold cocks him. It's a beauty. Just a roundhouse to the jaw. His head snaps back, and he does it a second time. It's, oh, man. Uh, and, and so this guy is just stunned, and then he staggers around a little bit like, okay, there was something else. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Oh, yeah, the, 
my friend's in the train pit. So he reaches in and, and grabs her. And by now, this guy takes off. Um, and, and so and then he whispers something to her. And uh, like, are you okay or whatever? And she apparently says yes. And then he's like, okay, good. And after him, he goes, chasing after him. All right, so I'll show that clip here. Let's see if I got... Okay, good. We have volume here. Okay. Now, let's see, are you okay? Yeah, all right, good. And off I go. Okay, now I'm going to show it to you a second time. Watch this guy. He actually looks like an EMT or something. He's got like a, like a kit or something. And he comes, he sees what happens. He comes dashing down here. And you'd think he would reach out. Oh, we've got to help this woman. She might get killed by the trail. Oh, no. He goes dashing after this guy. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Here he comes, here he comes. Oh my God, there's a woman down there. I better help this guy. I better get down there and help her, pull her up. No. <laughs> Are you okay? Oh, yeah. And off he goes. All right, so we have these competing urges, these bubbling up urges of, of just like, and, you know, and we've all felt it, that, you know, that burning white hat anger of this guy wronged me and I just want to cold cock him and just really punish him. That's that sense of revenge that you got to right a wrong. And it's good we have that. It's good because there's bad people. There's people that want to cheat the system. Free riders, bullies. you got to stand up to them. If you don't, they'll get away with it, right? So we have these urges. But we also want to help people too. I think we evolved this. This is not just a part of our species. Uh, these are capuchin monkeys. They have tiny little brains. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we're separated from them by like 20 million years. And they have a sense of right and wrong. So this is Franz Duval's research, uh, and uh, what you'll see here in this video clip is um, the experimenters handing uh, him a stone, a little pebble. They've been trained through just classical conditioning to associate the pebbles with food. So you give them the pebble, and they know, okay, I have to give it back. It's like buying, buying a piece of food. And so she gives them a cucumber, and they like cucumbers. And then she does the same one with this one, which he can see, uh, but, but she hands him a grape. And... You know, of course, they like grapes more than cucumbers because who doesn't? And, uh, <laughs> and so then he's kind of excited, like, oh, boy. Uh, so he hands her a stone, and she hands him a cucumber, and you'll see what happens. He is not happy about this. So Franz is uh, narrating this. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> it's just not fair. And you don't have to be able to articulate it with language. You can do it with body language. I think Alexander Solzhenitsyn said it trenchantly in the Gulag Archipelago. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? I'll show you what I mean. Here's another uh, quiz, participatory quiz here. You have to raise your hand, uh, and I want you to be honest. Come on, no holding back. Just be honest here. Have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Yep, I knew it. <clears throat> Me too. Uh, this is a question asked by the evolutionary psychologist David Buss at UT Austin. 
which he reported in his book, The Murderer Next Door, Why the Mind is Designed to Kill. Again, it's not for fun. It's to, uh, to serve justice, self-help justice. Here's the data. As you might predict, men were about twice as often as women to frequently think about killing somebody. <laughs> but women almost caught up on the occasionally <laughs> thinking about killing somebody. One guy said he went 80% of the way toward killing a former friend and now a jealous rival. First, I would break every bone in his body, starting with his fingers and toes, slowly making my way to the larger ones. Then I would puncture his lungs and maybe a few other organs, basically give him as much pain as possible before killing him. Uh, a woman said she went 60% of the way toward killing an ex-boyfriend who threatened to make public their sex video. I actually did this. I invited him over for dinner and as he was in the kitchen looking stupid, peeling the carrots to make a salad, I came to him laughing gently so he wouldn't suspect anything. I thought about grabbing a knife quickly and stabbing him in the chest repeatedly until he was dead. I actually did the first thing, but he saw my intentions and ran away. <laughs> <coughs> so evil begins with morality, as uh, Pinker says. Uh, the problem is too much moralizing. As I like to say, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the pilot of the plane, Mohammed Atta, that flew into the South Towers, I'm sure his moral module was dialed up to 11, truly believing this is the right thing to do. So again, when the terrorists or the killers yell out, uh, uh, you know, Allah Akbar, and, you know, we've avenged our prophet, we should believe what they say, that they say what they mean, they mean what they say. This is how it works. 90% of homicides are moralistic in nature. That is, the victim deserved to die. Okay, so one of the things of the many different factors that um, have driven the, the moral arc along, um, one of the points is to structure a social society in a way to attenuate the good side of uh, the bad side of human nature and accentuate the, the, the positive. Ever since the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, uh, we've been applying the methods of science to solving social problems. And... Um, uh, so, for example, uh, Thomas Hobbes, who is the author of uh, this book, Leviathan, you blow up the figure on the cover of Leviathan. Leviathan is, is considered to be the most important political tract ever written, most influential. The Leviathan is us. It's the citizens of a, of a society. So this is the first articulation of a social contract, that we are the government. It's us. Now, he went in a different direction toward the end and ended up with a pretty draconian state. We wouldn't want to live in that kind of state. But, but his point was... is. Um, that when um, Hobbes wrote this book, he self-consciously patterned, him, patterned himself after Galileo and William Harvey. He called himself that. I'm the Galileo of civil society. I'm the, the point is this, that what the scientists of the scientific revolution did was they, they realized, discovered, invented, and so forth, that the universe is governed by natural laws and we can understand them and apply them. Ever since then, that's what everybody tried to do. Every thinking scholar in every field basically said the universe is knowable, the world, society, political systems, economic systems, social systems. They're governed by principles and laws we can discover and understand and apply to make the world a better place solving problems. So the Leviathan state does a couple of things. First of all, it has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. That's not Hobbes' wording, that's Max Faber's wording. But uh, just think about the, the case in Ferguson. Uh, the moment you reach for a cop's gun, it's over. This cannot have a good ending. The state has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. They're the only ones that can legitimately carry guns and use them and so forth unless you have a carrying concealed. So on, and there's all sorts of rules about that. So that's what a civil state does. It decreases incentives for exploitative attack. I mean, if, you th if I think that you're going to attack me, maybe I'm going to preemptively attack you, but you're thinking that I'm thinking that, maybe you're going to preemptively attack me and so on. And so we have to put a stop to this. The state is supposed to do that. Uh, it reduces the need for deterrence and vengeance. It replaces self-help justice with criminal justice. Self-help justice is, you know, the guy on the platform. Uh, it's, you know, people that don't trust the state in third world countries or in areas of the United States where minorities, for example, don't believe that the ju criminal justice system is fair to them. Uh, so they don't call the police. Or if you're involved in an illegal activity like drug trade and some guy you know, moves in on your turf, you can't call the police and go, hey, the guy's selling crack cocaine in my corner and that's my corner. You can't do that. 
So you gotta settle the score yourself and that's, why, that's what drives violence up. Um, and uh, there's been some interesting studies now. I have a study I report on on pirates in the book. Uh, Pete Leeson's research at George Mason University on pirates. Pirates had a whole constitutional system of law and order on their ships. Pirates don't actually want to fight. Fighting and violence is too costly. Uh, it, it cuts into your profits. It'd be better if the, the victims just handed over their loot without having to fight for it. So this is why they, they fly the, the skull and crossbones flag. It's a signal. It's a signal saying we are badasses and if you don't hand us over the loot, we're going to just kick your ass and make things really miserable for you. But we don't actually want to do that. So we have to act like crazy people once in a while and then nourish a reputation for being like that. And then they'll just hand it over. <laughs> and really, this is what's happened with the Somalian pirates. It's just cheaper to give them the money. Just give them the, the ransom money. It's much cheaper than just in terms of a business, right? So this is what states are supposed to do. Um, and then finally, it replaces the culture of honor with the culture of law. In other words, what the state does is it acts as a shadow of enforcement to make us play nice by the rules. That is, we need a shadow of enforcement. There's actually a lot in that slide. Um, you know, this is, this is one of the functions of religion. You know, the founding fathers of the United States were not particularly religious. They were mostly deists, and, you know, to the extent that they believed in God at all, it was a non-participatory God. But... In, in a kind of a condescending way, they felt that the average citizen needed some sort of governor, some sort of, you know, heavy hand, but it wasn't possible to do that in those days, so they kind of believed in religion for the masses, an internal policeman telling you, I'm watching you, the invisible eye in the sky, and that's, a, and that's really part, partly what, how religions involved, evolved. You can see this in the data, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you about this public goods experiment, as they're called, or sometimes common goods games, uh, that study something called altruistic punishment, sometimes called moralistic punishment. So, uh, and so imagine you're sitting around a table with four people, four of you total, and I give each of you ten one dollar bills, you get ten bucks for free. And imagine you're a poor starving student, so it'd be nice to make a little money in the experiment, a little beer money. Uh, so, and, 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 and in the first round, first several rounds, first part of the experiment, you could make an anonymous contribution. No one knows how much you put in the envelope and you put in the common goods. And, and when you're done putting money in the commons, I'm going to multiply it by 1.5 and then distribute it evenly between all four of you. So let's say all four of you put in all $10, so that's 40 bucks, and then I multiply it by 1.5, so that's 60 bucks. I divide it by four, you each get 15 bucks. You just made five bucks, pretty good. You can buy a venti latte or a flat white at Starbucks uh, for that. Okay, so now we just keep playing the rounds. Okay, so here's what is an interesting calculation here. Um, let's say A puts five bucks in in hopes that B, C, and D each put 10 bucks in. Well, if this happens, here's what happens. So now we have $35 in the common pool, and I multiply that 1.5, and now I have 52 and a half bucks that I divide evenly four ways. So you each get $13.12 back. But A already has five bucks, so now he comes out ahead at $18.12, five bucks ahead of everybody else. How long do you think it is before everybody else realizes, wait a minute, somebody's getting a little more here than I'm getting? And then, what do you do? Well, here's the data. What happens in the first round here, without punishment and no transparency, um, contributions start to decline fairly rapidly. In other words, there's a, there's a collapse of cooperation. People just quit being nice and generous because somebody's cheating the system and we don't like that. Then Fair and Gachter in this famous experiment uh, added a, a second condition with transparency and the opportunity to punish those bastards who cheated the system and weren't playing nice. And all of a sudden, People got very generous and cooperative. In other words, uh, we really do need a set of rules uh, to make sure we're nice. This is why Justitia has the accoutrements she has. She has a scale for a fair and balanced trial. She has a blindfold, so she's not biased on who she's judging. And she has a sword to enforce the rules. Now, as my libertarian friends like to say, but all governments are bad. No, they're not. Actually... Some governments are worse than others. So the problem is, is that when states were first instituted, they became abusive themselves. And, and you know, death penalty, judicial torture, it was pretty nasty. Um, and uh, so the first uh, political scientist to start to document this was Rudy Rummel. He just died last year. 
Uh, Death by Government was his book that tracked every single person ever killed by their own government, to the extent that you can track that, because governments aren't too keen on political scientists nosing around in their books. Uh, but anyway, he estimated it's hundreds of millions. It's, it's really catastrophic. But it turns out that in the 20th century, three governments res- are responsible for the vast majority of democides, c- death by government. <coughs> and, um, and so, in fact, in his next book, Democracy as a Method of Nonviolence, he discovered that, in fact, some governments are better than others. Democracies are way better than autocracies and anarchies. Um, and putting that to the test, because Rudy didn't really test it that way, are Bruce Russett and John O'Neill. Just one aspect of what's called the democratic peace theory. Uh, they took the correlates of war project that recorded 2,300 militarized interstates disputes from 1816 to 2001, plus the polity project that I told you about that ranks governments on a 1 to 10 scale. Uh, on a democracy score, and what they found was that when both countries are fully democratic, disputes decline by 50%, and when the less democratic member of a pair lean toward autocracy, conflicts increased by 100%. In other words, the formula is as democracies increase, violence decreases. Now, this is a nice data set because it gets us past this uh, too simplistic view. No two democracies have ever fought each other. And the moment somebody says that in one of these talk shows, the other guy goes, yeah, well, what about the American Civil War? Those were two democracies. What about the American you know, uh, Revolutionary War? Those were two democracies. What about the Falklands in England? And you know, There's lots of exceptions. The point is, is that the more democratic you are, two countries are, the less likely they are to fight. It's not perfect. It's the same thing with Thomas Friedman's McDonald's theory of peace. No two countries with McDonald's have ever fought. Oh, yeah? Well, what about... Okay, except for those. Okay, just the more interdependence you are economically, the less likely you are to fight. Not perfect, but those are sort of the scales. Anyway, that's a whole other part of the book that I don't have time to cover. But you can see that in this graph here. Uh, These are the number of... um, uh, autocracies, democ- uh, dictatorships, and theocracies, and so on, um, it, which uh, peaked in the 1970s and then crashed in the 1990s, and the number of democracies really took off in the um, 19, late 80s, early 90s, and at the time that they crossed is when the number of wars, both interstate and societal conflicts, declined dramatically. Um, and you can really see it here in a test case between North and South Korea, since that's in the news, you know. Uh, I watched the interview the other night. <laughs> it's, it is so bad, it's funny. <laughs> uh, but you can see it from space. You can see the difference from space. You can see it in their heights, North Koreans, South Koreans. It's about a three-inch difference. You can see it in their per capita GDP. Why are they shorter? Because they got crappy diets. Why do they have crappy diets? Because they don't have much money. Uh, would you rather earn almost 20000 a year versus about $1,100 a year? And it really, the shift really happened when... Um, you know, they, they, they became a real closed society and quit trading with other people. So in other words, we're going to break the is barrier, the supposedly naturalistic fallacy that science has nothing to say about morals. Oh, nonsense. That's ridiculous. We know that democracies are better than autocracies, so we ought to do what we can to help the people in, living in these autocracies and dictatorships become democracies to the extent that we can do it. I know, I know it's a messy political process. The reason for this is because democracies place more emphasis on individual rights and individual liberty than any other form of governance, and thus they promote the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. Okay, so that's my moral starting point. The survival and flourishing of sentient beings is a basis for establishing values and morals. And so determining the conditions by which sentient beings best flourish ought to be the goal of a science of morality. Um, By sentient, I mean emotive, perceptive, sensitive, responsive, conscious, and therefore able to see, feel, and suffer. That's the basis of morality. Um, And I got that from Jeremy Bentham, uh, who in uh, 1823, I think that date's wrong. I have to double check that. Don't worry about that. Whatever his great book was on this subject, uh, in which he first articulated the arguments for animal rights. He was the first. In which he said, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? That's what we should be concerned about. Is can sentient beings feel and suffer? That's the, that's the concern. Why individual sentient beings? Because it's individuals, individual brains that perceive, emote, respond, love, feel, and suffer. Not populations, races, groups, tribes, states, or nations. In other words, uh, in fact, the rights revolutions are all about the freedom of individuals, not collective. Peoples, not groups. 
Rights protect individuals, not groups. In fact, many rights protect people from being discriminated as a member of a group. If you just think about that, it's individuals that vote, not races or genders. It's individuals that want to be treated equally, not groups. Um, and so, in other words, the constitutions of human societies ought to be built on the constitution of human nature, and it's science that is the best tool we have for discovering what that nature is and for determining, well, what are the best conditions, democracies and trade and all these different variables. That's what we do. That's what scientists do is they analyze data sets and figure these things out. But, but even more than that, I don't mean just as a tool. I mean, the very idea of natural rights is a discovery by enlightenment scientists. They, they didn't call themselves scientists. There was no, that word wasn't invented until the 19th century. They call themselves natural philosophers. We would call them scientists. They were, they were saying that there really is a better way to live, and we can figure out what that is, and that's what scientists do. Uh, and it has to do with that dual nature, so I will end with a, another quote from Martin Luther King, one of my heroes, uh, in which he said, each of us is two selves. The great burden of life is to always try to keep that higher self in command. And every time that a lower self acts up and tells us to do wrong, let us allow that higher self to tell us that we were made for the stars, created for the everlasting, born for eternity. <clears throat> well, Dr. King was a believer. I'm not. Uh, but So in my final sentences of the book, that we are, in fact, made from the stars. Our atoms were forged in the interiors of ancient stars that ended their lives in spectacular paroxysms of supernova explosions that dispersed those atoms into space where they coalesced into new solar systems with planets, life, and sentient beings capable of such sublime knowledge and moral wisdom. We are stardust. We are golden. We are billion-year-old carbon. I, I know you, you know the reference, right? <laughs> In other words, morality is something that carbon atoms can embody given a billion years of evolution. That's the moral arc. Thank you. Uh, your book, The Believing Brain, pretty much saved my life, so I'm a fan. Um, oh, man, I, I love used, you. No, I'm serious. I, used to, I was a believer for 27 <laughs> years, so. Wow. Um, okay. What I, what I struggle with, and I'm still hearing it kind of in your conversation, um, is Ipse Dixit because I say so it is on the moral arc here. And I think of like uh, Jacques Monod, science can only say what is and not what ought. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, John Gray, he's kind of discouraging in his book, The Silence of the Animals. Um, for somebody who is discouraged and feels like the world's kind of nihilistic, how would you comment to people like Gray or Monod's you know, declaration that science really can't finally say ought. Yep, Thank you. almost everybody repeats this mantra of the naturalistic fallacy, the is ought fallacy, that science has nothing to say about what's right and wrong. This, is, this gets repeated constantly that people misquote uh, David Hume, so I have a, a discussion of what Hume actually said, and then I have quotes from a Hume scholar in England that I met and asked him, do you really mean you could never, ever, ever say anything about right and wrong using reason and, and science and empiricism? No, of course not. And then, so I have a discussion about that. Uh, I think it's just time we just stop, just drop that meme. I mean, we're already doing it. We, we already use science in all sorts of ways. Like, I make the public health analogy that if you agree that saving hundreds of millions of people uh, by uh, the invention of the flush toilet and sanitation systems and sewer systems, epidemiological studies, public health measures, things like this that have saved hundreds of millions. If you agree that that's a good thing, you've just conceded that, that it's a good thing because the survival and flourishing of people is good. Why is it good? Because that's what we were designed to do by evolution. Natural selection selected us to be driven to find food and have mates and survive and flourish and so on. That's, what, that's in our nature. So that's my moral starting point. It's not a philosophical starting point. I mean, Sam Harris begins the, the, moral, the moral landscape with a, that philosophical standing point. I, I say we don't, we don't even have to call it philosophy. We can actually make a scientific argument for it using evolutionary theory. And from there, you're off and running. And everybody already agrees with this. I mean, anybody that would say, no, I don't agree that saving hundreds of millions of people is an absolute good. I think it's just a Western culture bias. And that surely there must be people elsewhere in the world who really enjoy dying of dysentery. And they like living in societies like that that are just god-awful and everybody's dying right and left. Yes, that's just a Western culture bias. Baloney! <laughs> oh. 
scared myself. <laughs> <coughs> okay, go ahead. You're not going to read me a big speech, are you, there on that phone? Um, I actually wrote it down so that I wouldn't ramble okay. and right. save everybody's time. Um, I would agree that we are, uh, by nature, empathetic towards our in-group, but I would argue that evolution hasn't shaped us to care about people we don't have extended face-to-face -face contact with. And in fact, as you referenced in your talk, there are probably evolutionary imp impulses towards a mistrust of others. Um, you also referenced the line about uh, good and evil running through each person's heart, and I think it's most likely that most of the people who commit quote-unquote immoral acts are not cartoon villains, but instead have at least a small in-group towards which they are partial, even loving and kind. Uh, so if you're pointing to evolution to say that caring about other sentient beings is evolutionarily grounded, what evolutionary fact do you have regarding empathy towards anyone outside of your in-group? Uh, none. So that is a great question. We, we're not naturally inclined to care about people that we don't know. Every fundraising group knows this. You know, you know those uh, late night adopt a child um, commercials you see? They don't show you like 10,000 kids. They show you one little Indugu. There he is. And he has a soccer ball and he has a brother and sister and he lives here in this little hut and your 1995 a month will get him water and so on. in other words it's tricking the brain into making little indugu a honorary member of your group your tribe your family your kin your friends so you'll care about it. it's tricking the brain and uh, so the whole point my point of my argument here is that the point of civil society is to trick your brain into caring about people you wouldn't otherwise care about and that's what we've been doing we've been expanding the moral sphere through a whole bunch of different techniques just think like the, like the gay rights and same-sex marriage um, you know, we know from research that people that know gays uh, and interact with them on the job or whatever are more likely to support same-sex marriage. Just the exposure to other people, oh, he's just like me. Or, you know, a new and a black or a Jew or an atheist. Oh, my God, he's an atheist. Oh, oh he's kind of normal. Uh, you know, this is, the, po this is the, po the point of the coming out campaign. So, you know, like Richard Dawkins' foundation campaign to coming out. He's following the gay rights campaign, which was coming out as gay, Okay. And it's like, okay, you know, Ellen and so on and Elton John and, you know, all these, you know, okay, so wow, all right, they're normal. And, uh, and that, that's how it changes. It, it expands, expands your, 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 your moral sphere, your moral considerations to others you wouldn't normally do that with. Reading, we think, there's some evidence on this. I just cited some new research in the book that just came out last year that people that read, like, Jane Austen novels, you know, because they're fairly convoluted. First of all, any novel puts you into the, the eyes of the novelist character, and you're looking at the world through their eyes. So that transports you into somebody else's head, it kind of trains your brain to do that. And especially these high, so-called high literature, as it's called, as opposed to reading like People magazine. That's the contrast in this experiment. People that were reading Jane Austen novels were better at mind reading, not the psychic stuff, the actual, you know, thinking, well, is this person upset? Are they angry? Are they depressed? Are they happy? Are they joyful? You know, just looking at facial expressions. People that read a lot are better at that. And uh, because, you know, Jane Austen novels, you know, he said that she thought that he was thinking that she was in love with him, but he was really in love with her. You know, it's just this convoluted thing. It, that, trains, that takes abstract reasoning ability. And, and so I think the reading revolution has helped that. I think the Internet's going to help that. Travel, trade, oh, just meeting other people that aren't like you. Um, sort of in that same vein, um, Throughout your talk, you used words like we, and the example you gave of us dying you know, in a war is very unlikely. Um, but for some people who aren't in this room, that just doesn't apply. So I'm curious where you draw the line of we and you and I when you're talking about that. R right. Where do I draw the line with we and you and I? Well, uh, what I meant, I guess, what I mean is just y you and I as individuals, anybody, it doesn't matter where they are. Uh, that the moral considerations should be individuals. Okay, I didn't talk about this, but the, you know, the uh, trolley experiment, the thought experiment, I'm sure you're all familiar with this because it's, it's been beaten to death in every book. Um, is, is, so the trolley is hurling down the tracks, it's about to kill these five workers, and you're standing at the switch. You can flip the switch if you want, and it'll go down this other track, and it'll kill the one worker. For some mysterious reason, they're all deaf and they can't hear the train coming. And you can't yell at him, get up! <laughs> uh, you know, it's a thought experiment, so. Uh, and so most people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions by now, have taken these little tests online, and there's a whole bunch of variations on it. But the bottom line is most people say, yes, I would flip the switch. I would kill the one to save the five. It's a simple utilitarian calculus. Um, but so the problem with that is that how does the one feel about it? 
Uh, you know, he, let's ask him, how, how do you feel about this? You know, should I flip the switch? No! Uh, you know, okay, so, so this is the problem with utilitarianism. It's too easy to, in the name of saving the, the, the group, the collective, the greatest number, it's too easy to sacrifice the one. And maybe it's not sacrificing one to save five, maybe it's sacrificing one million to save five million, or ten million to save fifty million. Those ten million Jews in Europe, the 50 million Europeans would be much better off without them. Greatest good for the greatest number. It's too easy to do that calculus. Before you know it, you've got a genocide. So always, that's why I think natural rights of the individual trumps any kind of utilitarian calculus you can make. You have to start with the individual. Cool. Actually, my, my question actually relates to that. It's a, it's a matter of personal versus collective well-being. And uh, I'm going to present it as a hypothetical here. So and you're familiar with heaven and hell, the concept of you know, infinite suffering, infinite pleasure. So here's the situation. You get a choice. One hand, uh, you, and just you, get to go to heaven and have the rest of eternity and great pleasure. And uh, everyone else goes to hell. Every other sentient being, every other conscious creature. Otherwise, it's the reverse of that. And you go to hell forever, and everyone else goes to heaven. What's... Where do, you, uh, where do you sit on that one? Oh, boy. Um, well, here I'm reminded of Christopher Hitchens, who reminded us that heaven is probably like celestial North Korea, <laughs> where you have this uh, uh, nasty no. dictator who knows your... Okay, so uh, that's sort of a cheap way around your... <laughs> yeah, so, so in heaven, in heaven, just as a... As a uh, uh, you, you don't experience any pain, any suffering from the guilt of sending people to hell. Yeah, yeah. That's, all, yeah, that's out yeah, of the picture. Yeah. Of course, I suppose selfishly I would pick for me, but... But so here's the problem why I'm more of a science guy than a philosophy guy, because at some point you have to go back into the real world where that never happens, where you're actually allowed to yell out, get up, the train's coming, and run over there and pick the, you know, pick the guy up, out of, pick the woman out of the train pit. You know. Okay, so that's, you know. <laughs> well, I have a master's degree in philosophy, so I won't ask you a philosophy question. Okay, but, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my thought is more towards democracy and its compatibility with science. Um, democracy, I think, has been called the worst form of government and the best one we've ever found. So I'm aw it's odd that you would put so much trust in democracy when people tend there's a strain of anti-intellectualism in this country, which Hofstadter and people have talked about a long time, and I think it's on a rise, sadly, more so than ever, in this country in particular. And I wonder, science tends to be top-down reasoning, right? So you get a small group of people who are very, very intelligent, come up with kind of fundamental breakthroughs that change the world, and those people try to then pass them on some way to the government so they can put forth the program. But oftentimes that's like, leads to things like eugenics, and it leads to the best of intentions, the yes. road to hell being paved with. But how, do you, how does a democracy com be compatible with, really, there's only a very small number of people who are able to come through with these very, very interesting insights and the wonderful yes. amount of science, but those people tend to be individuals who want to have the control top down, and that tends to lead to kind of, um, yeah. it's anti-democratic. Yep. So, um, well, Thomas Jefferson described the American democracy as an experiment. He referred hundreds of times, the American experiment, the Ameri democracy experiment. It's an experiment in, in the sense that you, you, you tweak the variables and you run it for a while and see how it goes, collect some data, have the tweaking the variables and running it again is call it an election. And uh, you, so you throw the bums out, you bring some new bums in and try them for a while. And, uh, and so in a way, it's, uh, the, the, the premise is, is that nobody knows how to run a country. You can't, you can't do it from the top down. It's too complex. It's a complex, dynamic, auto, uh, um, autocatalytic system, constantly changing and, and um, it, with emergent properties. No, nobody can run it from on top. So what we need to do is break up you know, the centers of power and have the people from down under have as much say as we can. Transparency, uh, you know, the, and the people should have some uh, act, act, active involvement in the political process. That, that was the idea. Now, uh, the other thing I like about Sam's moral landscape metaphor is that you can have multiple peaks on the moral landscape. There's not one democracy. There's lots of different democracies. You know, we're, we're, a, we're not really a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. It's very different from the British system, for example, and theirs is different from the French system and the German system and, and so on. These are multiple peaks. There's lots of different ways. They're all better than these, the, the North Korean ones, you know, and, and so forth. And so that's the, the, the point is of the science metaphor, not metaphor, the, the, what we're really doing is experimenting with different things and see what works as measured by just human flourishing, it, by any measure, it's better now than before.
Even if democracies are not great, they're better than the other ones. And, and maybe not, we don't have to have used the word. Whatever it takes for there to be, to be transparency, no one has too much power, people have autonomy and freedom and liberty and a say in the political process, that, that's what, what works. Why not a technocracy, though? Why not, why not government? Why, I mean, I guess I, most utopian systems... <coughs> be, because, because any te technocrat or scientist has the same... Uh, desires as everybody else for power, for greed, for corruption. They're just as subject as everybody else. There's no reason to think that the moment you put him in a political position, he's going to be nice, you know, and perfectly transparent and fair. Um, you know, the, the, it just doesn't work that way. And, and, and you know, the founding of Madison in, in, in the, you know, in, in his papers there writing about, you know, that if, if men were angels, government would not be necessary. We're not. And, uh, and scientists aren't going to be any better at that. But, but the, way, the reason science works pretty good because there's a system that says if you don't find the biases in your research, somebody else will and you'll be debunked and embarrassed and humiliated and some graduate student's going to you know, make their career by you know, showing that your crazy idea is wrong and their crazy idea is right. You know, it's, all, it's a competitive process. Uh, Karl Popper called this um, conjecture and refutation. You, know, you, put, you put a conjecture out there, a hypothesis, an idea, but it has to be open peer review. Everybody can have a shot at it. So the refutation part is where the action is. It's like, okay, let's have at it. And out of that, we'll get a few good ideas. So science is kind of conservative in a way because most ideas are idiotic. They're wrong. They're stupid. They're dumb. But out of all that mess, you get a few that turn out to be right. So that's why we have to have free speech. You have to have an open society. It's the only way we can make progress because most of us are wrong most of the time and we're biased. One more? We've got one more. Okay. <coughs> right. Hey, thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so earlier you mentioned moral agency. You talked about a car, and we, we don't blame cars for car accidents because they don't have nefarious intentions. Uh, you've also, also spoken a little bit about Sam Harris's book, uh, The Moral Landscape, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, Free Will, as well. And his argument basically is moral agency is an illusion because there's no free will because everything that we do, whether it's our thoughts or our actual mm -hmm. actions, they're all just influenced by our genetics or our environment. And so we can't really be held as moral agents. Uh, I was just wondering what your opinion on that was. And yes, I, I disagree with, with uh, Sam on that. I, I think we do have moral agency and free will and autonomy. Uh, we do make choices. Uh, I still you know, believe, believe we live in a determined universe, but it, it, within the causal net, the choices we're making are still part of the causal net of the universe, but they're choices made in our brains. So you probably all know about uh, Benjamin LeBay's experiments that everybody's written about, you know, that, that you're, you're supposed to press a button at some point when a clock is, hand is moving across. And I, I decided right there when it was there, but, but the, the brain scan shows that we know you decided when it was actually over here and you didn't even know because it's some subconscious part of your brain that's making the decision you're not aware of. Okay, but it's still your brain. It's still your brain making the decision. And furthermore, subsequent research to that uh, by Benjamin LeBay himself and others show that there's a, this, what he called, free won't. That if you give people the option to change their mind, they change their mind, and that happens at a higher cortical level. So, in other words, you have these sort of impulses bubbling up. I'm going to kill that mother. I'm just going to... Okay, count to ten, count to ten. You know, what, what you're doing is, is your prefrontal cortex is coming in going, hold it now, hold it. Uh, you know, this could make things worse. Uh, you know, so, that, so people that have brain damage... So I talk about Adrian Rain's research. Adrian Rain is the, the neuroscientist that scans the brains of serial killers on death row, and, uh, and, and their prefrontal cortexes are just mush. I mean, they have no control at all. They're just bubbling urges. They, you know, just, they just react to everything instantly, and they have no self-control. So it's, and the end of his book is basically, our, it's called The Anatomy of Violence. It's a great book. And he, he said, well, we have to do something about this. In other words, instead of, treating, instead of moralizing about why people kill other people, let's try to figure out why they do it. And why they're, we all have these impulses that bubble up. How come some people, most of us, we don't just go out and punch people? Um, you know, bad reviews, bam. Uh, you know, I'd like to do this, but, you know, I'm not going to do it. But how come this other guy does? Well, there's something wrong with his prefrontal cortex. You know, it's just not active. How can we get it more active? Maybe get some glucose in there. Maybe some dopamine. Maybe give him some drugs. Maybe we can train, train him for self-control. You know, this is the problem with the disease model of addiction. You know, you, you can't, 
will your way out of cancer. But lots of people do will their way out of diseases, I mean, uh, out of addictions and alcoholism and so on. Lots of people do. How, why is it that some can't and some can? Okay, we need to understand the brain. That's science at work. And, uh, and that takes some, that's still some agency. I'm deciding to do that. I know these are the variables. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's techniques for, for increasing your self-control, your willpower. You know, don't go shopping on an empty stomach. You know, don't have the stuff in the fridge. You know, get, throw away the ice cream in the morning because you're not going to do it in the evening. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you can strengthen your self-control muscle through practice by, you know, tempting a little bit and then resisting the, t you know, the marshmallow test, you know, and all that. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so I, I think we have agency there. Absolutely. I do. So, if you, I'm not a philosopher, but Dan Dennett's compatibilist argument in freedom evolves. I'm, I'm kind of on board with that. And if you disagree with that, you can take it up with Dan because he's a professional philosopher. <laughs> yes, passed it along. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate you having me here.